Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we are going to talk about something that I think everyone has experience of and with, but is... Um, by very definition, kind of hard to define and nail down, and that is intuition. And what Jung says about intuition is, he says, intuition I take as perception by way of the unconscious or perception of unconscious contents. And then he also goes on to say, oh, what does this mean for me or for the world? Uh, what emerges in the way of a duty or a task. So for me, this frames the whole idea of intuition as first, what is it? And then um, how do we check it out? What do we do with it? How do we know what it means? So with all that said, um, why don't we intuitively leap into our topic of intuition? Well, the first thing that I, I want to mention to the, the listeners is the three of us are intuitive feeling types. So intuition and feeling are primary in the way that we experience the world and in the way that we gather data. So I yeah. think we'll all, we'll all be talking in some ways from a very subjective experience. <laughs> well, I, I also want to say we should... Um, make the frame a little larger here with you having said, Joseph, that we're intuitive feeling types. According to Jung, there are four functions of consciousness or four ego functions. Two of them he called rational functions, and two of them he called irrational, or I would call them non-rational functions. So the two rational functions are thinking and feeling, which is, from a Jungian point of view, those are the ways in which we establish values and make decisions. Uh, so feeling may be a more subjective orientation to valuing and decision-making, but it is rational, uh, absolutely as rational as uh, what we think of as thinking. And the two non-rational functions are sensation and intuition. Uh, sensation is just what you think it is, uh, touch, uh, sight, hearing, taste, and hands-on kinds of things of what needs to be done right now. And intuition is what we're going to talk about. But they are ways of getting information. They're just not cognitive. So um, here we are talking about our subjective decision-making process which from a Jungian point of view is feeling, and then this way of taking in information and what we do with it from an intuitive place. This is where I wish that I had a stronger background in neurobiology oh. <laughs> because, you know, I, I feel as though 
<laughs> I intuit that, that, you know, that, that, that intuition as a kind of implicit or unconscious way of knowing has been validated by research into a neurobiology, that there are ways that we learn and know things that uh, is kind of below the threshold of conscious awareness. In fact, that's probably, probably a lot of what we learn and know is experienced that way. And I mean, we know, for example, that we read each other's facial expressions um, very, very quickly. For example, there are all these tiny little muscles around the eyes in particular that um, control, you know, how, how, you know, what our face does, for example. And so, you know, when your teenager walks in the room and immediately intuits that you're angry, even though you're trying very, very hard to be equanimous and, you know, and, and your teenager says, why are you so mad at me? <laughs> you're thinking, I'm really trying yes. here, you know, but, but that, but that's, that's intuition at work, you know? So, and it makes sense that, mm -hmm. that we've evolved ways to read each other in a very finely tuned yeah. way below the, the threshold of say verbal interaction. Lisa, you make such a good point about the neurobiology uh, involved in intuition and all the many, something like 40-something little muscles that communicate facial expression so that we can read each other. And I would add that um, culture is also a huge part of that, of what are the norms and the habits, uh, the conventions of any culture. And these things help us to to read one another and the environment without having to go through a laborious decoding process. Yeah, and it's just stuff that you know and you don't know how you know it. For you know, for example, my my teenager takes takes one quick look at my face and knows that I'm angry, even though I'm desperately trying to appear pleasant. <laughs> you know, and 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 if if I had said to her, you know, well what makes you think I'm angry? <laughs> you know? She, she, she wouldn't have had an answer because it, it just went in directly her, mm -hmm. her receiving that, whatever that was that I was giving off just went directly. It was kind of unconscious to unconscious really. You mentioned something that to the highly intuitive person, the intuition is experienced as if it's a sensation. Hmm. So to your daughter, when you walk in and you're feeling uh, angry, secretly angry, and she's certain that she experiences that as true but cannot explain it, in, this, in the subjective experience of the intuitive, it's as if your anger is a sensation in the room. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I will share that I feel as though my clinical work is largely based on my intuitive capabilities. And so when things are going well in the work, I'm letting the other person's presence and their words wash over me. And a lot of times what comes up is an intuition. And that often presents in a kind of fully formed way, something I just kind of know, and I put that in quotation marks, and I'll say more about that in a second, about the person, or it comes up as an image, maybe sometimes it presents as an, a funny image. And when I think about what that, what that image might mean vis-a-vis -vis that person, then an insight perhaps unlocks, but I'll always test it with the person. So if I'm sitting with someone and I just suddenly sort of think, this person has a very wounded uh, relationship with her father, let's say a new person. I might share that and I will, I will say, listen, this is coming from an intuitive place. So it could be totally wrong, mm -hmm. but let me put it out there. And, you know, many times it's right, but it's not always right. They're, they're not um, some kind of all knowing magical omniscience they can be wrong, and it's important not to overvalue them. Yeah. So uh, I think you're saying something that's really important, that we do pick up information that's normally outside uh, the range of cognitive processes, and we get it at a, at a feeling level and sometimes at a body level. 
you know, of like, whoa, I just had this feeling that there was a chill in the room and I could feel, you know, the hair on the back of my arms go up. And that feels so powerful sometimes that it's like, wow, I know this, I'm certain of it. Uh, this is knowledge. But you're lifting up how important it is to check it out uh, with another person, to use other processes to either verify the intuition or to uh, disprove the intuition, you know? So in the case of your client, the client could say, actually, that doesn't really quite fit for me. I don't think it's about my father. I think it's more about, you know, it might be something else altogether. So I'm thinking about the system of checks and balances that we need to have access to. When I think of the issue of intuition being wrong or right, I find myself more focused on whether or not the intuition is meaningful because any product of the soul has a certain value to it, much like a dream. Is a dream wrong or right? I don't, I don't think of it that way. The question is, is it meaningful or is the meaning being made valuable within a given mm -hmm. moment? Mm -hmm. So when I'm experiencing an intuition, it is possible that I'm misinterpreting the target of the intuition. Mm -hmm. I could misinterpret the timing of the intuition, which I think is the most common struggle with intuitive types. Because intuitives are perceiving potential. Mm -hmm. And because intuition is a vertical experience, the manifest reality of the potential is not clear often to the intuitive. Mm -hmm. One good piece of advice that I give to intuitive feeling types is stop falling in love with somebody's potential. <laughs> and then therefore staying in a romantic relationship year after year after year that is powerfully under functioning because you're related to the potential in the person or the potential in the marriage. And at a certain point, we need some concrete facts to interrupt and declare how long is it going to be mm -hmm. before my partner achieves this this grand and beautiful possibility that maybe you fall in love with them in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So falling in love with someone's potential is a, is something that should be taken seriously. The other difficulty in terms of intuition, I think, which transcends the issue of is it right or wrong, perhaps is how far in front of the ego's awareness is the intuition landing. Mm -hmm. particularly as analysts, when we're beginning to see a trend emerge or sense it intuitively or sensing material bubbling up inside of the analytic container, our intuition might be describing something very, very accurately, but that does not automatically create a bridge between the conscious personality and what's bubbling up. And so I think one of the great challenges for intuitives, myself very much included, is to know what we know, but also to understand that we're responsible for creating a bridge between the current situation and what we see emerging in such a way that any use can be made of it. Yeah, th those are great points, Joseph. And I, I think you're abs you're actually right about that, that it's not that they feel wrong, but they maybe are misplaced or mistimed or uh, sometimes misinterpreted. Um, I, I think I'm trying to guard against the possibility of inflation, because when when you're highly intuitive, it can feel almost magical. Uh -huh. And that can be a little dangerous. But I love what you said about building a bridge. And I, I think that this is the hard thing about intuition is that sometimes you get a gigantic intuition and you don't know how to use it. And you know there's something there, but you you can't necessarily um, fit it in with the rest of the world. I mean, I'm thinking of the myth of Cassandra that we've referenced before on the podcast. And, you know, she had this, she was granted this gift of, um, of prophecy, but was cursed in that she, you know, she would know what was going to happen, but no one would believe her. 
And sometimes that can be the experience of being intuitive if you can't build that bridge, that you don't know how to make what you know of use in the world or to yourself. Mm -hmm. If I may, I want to share a personal example um, that brings up a lot of issues that I'm hoping we can talk about today. One of which is like, how do you know when it's just an anxiety versus kind of a premonition or an intuition? When I was working in the former Yugoslavia, I I was, um, it was like a beautiful sunny day and I was in the the Croatian city of Split right on the Adriatic and I was in this beautiful park and I think I was jogging or biking or something in the morning and um, and just all of a sudden out of nowhere, I was just hit with this wall of foreboding and fear. So much so that I stopped. I stopped. I got absolutely still and quiet. And I thought, you know, this is, this does not happen to me every day. Something important just happened. What is it? I tried to listen to it. I tried to see what else was there. There was nothing else there. After a few minutes, I said, all right, let me continue. It happened a second time. Same thing. I stopped. I tried very much to listen to it. I, I was trying to work with it, but there was, there was nothing else there. And I, I didn't know how to make use of it. So later that day, um, we traveled to our office in central Bosnia and um, it was a total nor totally normal day, but that was the night uh, where we were uh, staying in a, in a house and we were, we had four, you know, four men armed with Kalashnikovs break into the house. And I, you know, I thought I was going to be raped. I thought I was going to be murdered and everything worked out okay. But, uh, you know, it was like, damn, you know, and I, I think to myself, so what, what could I have done with that intuition to avoid that situation? I don't know that there was anything. I do like to think that having had that experience that morning, perhaps prepared my psyche in some way for what I was about to face. And perhaps it helped me keep my wits about myself because, you know, I think we partly survived because we were, we were savvy, but it's, it's, it's a little distressing to know that you can know something, uh, but not always be able to know how to use it. I really can um, hear that in terms of the preparation for this is a possibility of uh, somewhere there, it was out there as a, a possibility, even as an idea. I think you're holding it and paying attention to it did provide some ground for the experience, uh, a kind of rehearsal or something in a way of uh, just an awareness that there could be danger. But what you didn't do was to try to nail it down to uh, something premature and specific that would have been uh, really erroneous. But I think it was there. And I think intuition can be very valuable in, in that way. Of I don't know what it means yet, um, but I hear it and I'm paying attention to it. Uh, you know, when we lived in New York, there are people where you have an intuition of I shouldn't walk down this side street at night. I really just shouldn't. There's something that feels funny about it to me. Uh, and I've had that experience. And I have no idea, you know, whether that was a real intuition or whether that was anxiety or fear. Or common sense. <laughs> or, but there's no downside, right? Just it doesn't cost me anything to walk another couple of blocks and uh, walk on a well-lit, more major street. So I, I think some of these things are, uh, are really useful, even if we don't know what, what the use it can be put to is yet, but at least to hold it. I think there is a distinction between intuition and instinct. And I think they're both amazing. And Jung was fascinated by both of them. I think in his writing, Jung felt more confident about instinct that the inner creature, the inner animal, this <laughs> millions of years of genetic wisdom that's woven into our flesh and bones has its own perception of reality. And there is that ancient part of us that casts down the dark street. Some part of our brain smells something, some movement out of the corner of our eyes. 
our skin knows something that maybe our brain doesn't know that tells us um, something is dangerous and that it's worthy of our attention. Mm -hmm. So Joseph, to you, that's instinct? To me, that I would call that instinct because it's coming from the body mm. and it's coming from a level of soul that is connected to the natural world, connected to concrete objects and the whole field of creatures that we co-participate in. I would call that instinct. And often, as we've seen in fairy tales, when an animal gives advice, it's often very, very stark, very unemotional also, very direct and almost always exactly what needs to be done. What I'm taking from this is agreement of all of these things we're saying and our uh, evolutionary wisdom that has wired us for sensing things. But I'm also aware of how important it is not to nail it down too specifically and prematurely because Intuition can sometimes also just be magical thinking or bias or uh, any one of a number of other things that later on just proved to be dead wrong. Well, what's, what are some examples that you're thinking that actually have to do with intuition there? Well, I'm thinking, of course, about biases, uh, that we just have this bias uh, against a particular group of people or a certain political party or whatever else. And, you know, that sense of, I, but I know this, because it's tied to habit and a powerful feeling function. And so all those things together leave the person feeling that this must be absolutely right. I wouldn't feel this strongly about it if, if I weren't really right. Uh, my intuition tells me that. And sometimes there can be, um, you know, terrible mistakes in linking cause and effect. Of, and we see this sometimes in uh, thought disordered people, people who are really delusional or who have some level of paranoia. And their intuition convinces them that these, these perceptions are correct. So we can get lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Okay. <laughs> just, just sort of call something an intuition and then think that that grants it kind of primacy. Jung wrote in great detail about extroverted intuition and the uh, incredible potency. He says that the intuitive's morality is governed neither by thinking nor feeling. He has his own characteristic morality, which consists in a loyalty to the vision and in voluntary submission to its authority. Consideration for the welfare of others is weak. Their psychic well-being counts as little with him as does his own. He has equally little regard for their convictions and way of life. And on this account, he is often put down as an immoral and unscrupulous adventurer. So I, I think that speaks to that once the intuitive certainty <laughs> has just <Yeah>. absorbed <laughs> someone, that all these petty considerations, uh, like other people's feelings or uh, what one has to do to, to make manifest the intuitive vision, takes a big step down and uh, we can be off and running, full steam ahead. <laughs> just if I'm remembering a... Um during training one time when we were discussing cases, you would, you would do this thing when we were presenting cases where all of a sudden you'd be quiet, but then you'd speak up and you'd sort of have this incredibly, this full blown, fully formulated kind of vision that would just kind of drop into the room about, about the, the clinical case that was being discussed. And it was always so, you know, really brilliant, but also kind of baffling, I, I rem if I recall, to one of our um, case colloquium leaders, you know, and it was really your intuitive style that things just sort of emerge like Athena from, from the <laughs> thigh of Zeus, like fully for the head of Zeus, you know, fully formed, you know, um, that is part of being an intuitive is that it's not a stepwise process. It's suddenly grasping just the whole scene and the whole context, and you just see the whole forest, and other people are going, wait, 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 I haven't even found the tree yet. Right. Or it feels um, disruptive. I remember one of our cohorts very quietly saying after I had uh, 
downloaded an intuitive interpretation of her case, she very quietly said, it's like you can see every little crack in the case and break it wide open in the front of everyone else. And I was like, ouch, oh, I really heard it. You know, there's something inattentive to the relational field in mm -hmm. the cold declarative bigness of an intuitive perception. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's often the, criticism of intuitives is that there is a relational impact that the intuition is not interested in and not attending to, mm -hmm. but the ego is responsible for finding a way to monitor that. I, I think the way that shows up for me is um, I just, I just have always have new ideas and, you know, ideas about possible things that could be done, whether it's like, how I want to fix up my office or, uh, you know, that we should do a podcast <laughs> <laughs> or, or anything in between, like, like what we should put on the pizza for dinner, you know, and it's, and it's just, it's kind of exhausting and it, it can exhaust the people around me. <laughs> well, it's like Noah showing up and saying, I've got a plan mm -hmm. and just like, you know, co-opting the entire planet to make this art, <laughs> you know, at, at, with no sense of cost to yeah, anyone yeah. else. You know? yeah. mm -hmm. So it's um, underscoring the need to balance intuition with some kind of self-reflective process of, wait a minute, yeah. you know, how is this affecting the people around me? What's it going to take to build this ark thing and round up all those animals have I checked it out with um, facts? I mean, even something as mundane as a Google search, you know, wait a minute, uh, what do other people say? How do other people add these things up? Because people can get swept away one way or another with the power of this intuitive idea, force, interpretation, take on things. So those other functions of thinking and feeling and sensation are important to keep it in balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Jung, the way he says it, just as uh, you were mentioning, Deb, in consciousness, the intuitive function is represented by a certain attitude of expectation, a perceptive and penetrating vision, wherein only the subsequent result can prove how much was perceived into mm -hmm. and how much actually lay in the object mm -hmm. of the intuition. Mm -hmm. So it goes to this, the subsequent result, this idea of whether it's research or living out the intuitive plan that we find out what's actually there and what have we imposed, perhaps fantastically so. Mm -hmm. yeah. I feel as though I invoke intuition often when I'm trying to talk about how the unconscious speaks to us. And, you know, I, I do think that it's one of the chief ways that we get inklings of what's going on with this, you know, other, other within us that has a very different perception on us. You know, one of the key ways is through dreams, of course, but intuition is another one. And uh, sometimes intuitions kind of poke through the cracks by um, we get a song stuck in our head. And we think, why am I thinking of that song? And when we think about the lyrics, we realize that it's giving us a different perspective, perhaps on something that we're doing or a decision that we're in the midst of. So there again is the, the importance of being curious and having a dialogue, uh, which is what Jung says and what we say over and over again is, uh, if intuition comes from the unconscious, dreams come from the unconscious, a song that gets stuck in your head comes from the unconscious, have a dialogue with it. That just because it comes from the unconscious doesn't mean it's right. And Jung did not privilege unconscious contents over consciousness. Uh, what he said was, it's the old story of the hammer and the anvil, uh, that consciousness and unconscious contents should have it out with each other. It's like, okay, what about that song lyric? Or, mm -hmm. or what about my brilliant idea, my incredible intuition that our entire family should pack up and uh, live on a Pacific island? Whoa, wait a minute. 
let's uh, hold that and really explore uh, intuition versus a lot of other input, including, of course, from family members. The other thing I want to um, add into, and I think we've all had this experience, that very, very strong intuitions about a person or any kind of particular object can really influence the object. That when unconscious material surfaces like that, even if we hold it secretly, it creates a kind of field of influence. It pulls or pushes things around. I mean, when we have an intuition about somebody who's close to us and we, and it's incredibly intense in our psyches, it does seem to influence that person when at least they're around us. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you guys have had that experience. Give me an example of what you're thinking of, Joseph. I'm not mm -hmm. sure I'm 100% tracking. Sure. So I'll have an intuition that a client is gestating a, a new creative project. And I'll feel it in the room. Mm -hmm. I'll feel mm -hmm. it as a certain nexus of tension in the room. And as I'm nursing that, and then maybe in a session or two, they actually verbalize this emergent creative process. Mm -hmm. As Jung describes the intuitive function and even synchronicity, he believed that the emergence of the intuitive perception in the analyst is actually influencing the emergence of the idea in mm -hmm. the analysis hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that goes to Jung's um, diagram about how we do influence one another uh, socially and sort of conscious to conscious and also unconscious to unconscious communication, that we are wired for one another and we can pick up what I think you're talking about, Joseph. He says, intuition, which is by no means a mere perception or awareness, but an active creative process that builds into the object just as much as it takes out. But because this process extracts the perception unconsciously, it also produces an unconscious effect on the object. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So intuitives can be highly charismatic and highly influential on situations and people and circumstances around them. That's yeah. interesting. So it's not just perception, it's this kind of two-way thing. And that's some of maybe what goes on in this realm is co-created, which we would act absolutely think about in terms of psychotherapy and how there's an intersubjective field that gets constellated. And so what's happening in the room is, you know, there's a way that we both, the analyst and, and the analyst have co-participated in giving birth to that. And I'm thinking of both of you as moms. There are certain moments where you have an intuition about your child or their potential, where they're going. And the clearer your intuition about that is, just the appearance of the intuition co-creates the potential that the child could manifest that. It is something very radical that Jung is saying. But if our perception is really accurate about emergent potential, we are co-participating in a field. I think it's interesting that you bring up being a mom because that was something I was going to raise. Because I think that, uh, you know, especially when you're dealing with infants, there's this thing about maternal attunement. And I think most moms can relate to having a weird way of knowing what was going on, especially with their baby, on just an intuitive level. And it makes so much sense, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, I think I said something like this a few minutes ago, but it makes so much sense that we would come into the world equipped to be able to read our infant's needs. Because that that's essential to the survival of humanity, right? That a, that a mom can do that. So it really is rather remarkable the extent to which 
there's this kind of co-regulation of nervous systems with an infant, you know, and, and how much you pick up and, and what feels. I mean, I just remember just knowing all kinds of things about my infants um, from early, early on. And, you know, like she's getting a fever <laughs> and other people are like, what are you talking about? Her fever's totally normal. But then, you know, two hours later, it's like, yeah, she has a fever. And I, I remember my own mother, you know, calling me up when I was in my 20s and call, just calling me up from, you know, hundreds of miles away saying, is everything okay? <laughs> I would say, yeah, why? And she said, I was just worried about you. I just had a feeling that you were down or something. And of course I was, but I wasn't telling her that, you know, so it's really remarkable. Yeah. I think mothers are uh, very much wired. I've had two clients who's, who saved the lives of their babies uh, just intuitively by insisting that something was wrong. When people said, no, it's just a cough. Uh, it's, it's nothing, you know, the baby is fine. And it turned out uh, to be something that needed to be uh, surgically removed from the baby's mm. throat and would have asphyxiated the baby. Oh, my gosh. So, and another uh, situation, uh, different health problem, but that knowing and uh, and sticking with their intuition, and thank goodness they did. And overall, uh, branching out from moms to women in general, um, the research says that women in general score higher on intuition than men do. Mm -hmm. and, That's interesting. And that we are all um, especially well-wired intuitively to detect deception, uh, which is interesting. And then that goes to the real challenge of self-validation. How many of us have either been in the situation that our clients say, something is wrong with this person I'm dating, I feel like this scenario is unfolding, I have no outer data to justify it, I just know it's true. And of course, they wait, waiting for facts to emerge, and lo and behold, the unconscious was five steps ahead of what, uh, what the senses could report. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Which is kind of back to that Cassandra complex of knowing something before it hits the outer world and yeah. having even one's ego be unwilling to believe it, let alone anybody else who we're telling it to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That I still go back to your phrase, Joseph, about building the bridge mm -hmm. of where is the bridge from the inner knowing to the outer world and uh, how valuable that can be. But if we don't have the bridge, uh, we can get uh, led astray. Uh, I'm curious about how uh, the intuitive function operates in dreams. We've had clients and ourselves have had dreams that tell us something where when we wake up, we say, oh, I don't know, or maybe it's true, or that, that our unconscious and dreams can uh, give us clues. Well, and sometimes, I mean, there's some quite extraordinary dreams of alerting people to a health crisis, mm -hmm. right? Someone has a dream and the dream is simply, you've got cancer. I mean, I've known someone with a dream like that. She woke up in the morning, she made a doctor's appointment, she had cancer. You know, Deb, you had your incredible dreams when you were pregnant with your twins. Oh, yes. Uh, absolutely. You know, and I, uh, this was so long ago, uh, but I remember uh, telling uh, uh, several people that I thought I was pregnant with twins because the dreams were so uh, clear, specific, and repeated. And then I decided I had better, I better just shut up about it because um, I hadn't at that point even had a positive pregnancy test. Wow. And so I, you know, there I doubted my, my own intuition. And of course, I think we've all had dreams or intuitions that have proven to be tied to something that proved not to be the case at all. Uh -huh, uh, of course. And the, there are the famous dreams, too, that we've uh, probably all read about of uh, Mendeleev, the Russian chemist who, who per perceived the periodic table of elements. He created it based on a dream. And I think uh, Isaac Singer, when he was trying to develop the sewing machine, uh, had a dream of people carrying spears that had holes in the blades. And that gave him the idea that... Um, 
one of the sewing machine needles had to have uh, a hole in it. It's a it's a tricky business, isn't it? This uh, wonderful capacity that we have for intuitive perception, and, and that it really is an unconscious kind of right hemisphere process, and yeah. and the difficulty is knowing how to translate it across. Yes, building the bridge. And one of the tensions I think is intuitive types that I know I bear is between the telos or the possibility that's emerging versus mirroring what the current experience is. So particularly in delivering psychotherapy, there's a strong Rogerian preference for staying right where the client is, finding language to mirror precisely where the client is and to create a a sense of reassurance and companioning in that environment. That is in some ways antithetical to a highly developed intuition, which is focusing several steps forward of the current situation. Mm -hmm. And, And often when intuitives are communicating, there can be a sense that they've left the client behind or left their families behind in this forward looking vision. And even though the intuitive feels and is certain that this is deeply intimately connected to the client or to our friends or family because the individual can't find the linkage. It actually feels as if they're being abandoned in some way or that something alien alien is being imposed into the conversation Mm -hmm. and intuitives are often surprised by that reaction because it doesn't feel alien to the intuitive at all. Well, I know everyone will be shocked at this, at what I'm about to say, but I do have a fairy tale. Oh, that really oh my God. Oh, I know, astounding. I know. I just, I'm so, I'm so mysterious and unpredictable. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think that actually kind of intuition shows up all the time in fairy tales. You know, the, the little old woman by the well, the talking animals. I think we could think about all of that as a potential manifestation of intuition. But there's this great story from Africa, and it's called The Three Little Eggs. And uh, in the story, a woman is married and she has three children. And her husband is a terrible, and he beats her and he's unkind to her. And so one day she decides that she needs to leave. He's gone to a festival and she takes the kids and she escapes. She's walking along. She doesn't know where she's going. She follows a tiny trickle of a stream. And at one point she finds a bird's nest in a tree and it has eggs in it, even though it's the middle of winter. So she takes the nest and gives it to her children to play with and says, be careful that you don't break the eggs. So she's walking along and she comes to a crossroads. She says, I don't know which way to go. And this tiny little voice says, take the trail to the right. And the voice was coming from one of the eggs. So she takes the trail to the right. Later, she comes to another crossroads. She doesn't know where to go. Another tiny voice says, take the trail to the left. And it comes from a different egg. So uh, it goes on like this. She winds up coming across um, first a house where there's all kinds of wonderful food set out where she and her children can eat and refresh themselves. Then they keep going. She comes to another hut and this one has ogres in it. And the eggs guide her in first attempting to kill the ogres. But when it becomes too much, they they say, you know, climb off the, wait till they fall asleep, then, you know, run for safety. And she does. And eventually she meets up with this giant ogress and the talking eggs again, coach her in how to defeat this giant ogress. So she has to take an ax and hack the ogress to death. And when she does so, all of these people exit from the ogress's stomach where they had been consumed and had to live for a long time inside the ogress. And so everyone is so grateful to her uh, that she has rescued them. And then the eggs turn into three 
uh, princes or something who they were under a spell and she broke the spell. And so she winds up marrying one of them and, you know, living happily ever after. But it's a wonderful image, I think, of intuition. These, these, these talking eggs that tell her where to go when she's in the midst of great, great danger. And, and I'm aware that it starts in a way uh, with her being kind and in a, in a sense welcoming uh, something that will be intuitive. As she tells her children, be very careful not to break the eggs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's the big question because we are influenced by all kinds of internal promptings complexes whisper in our ears, the self whispers in our ears, maybe the body wisdom whispers in our ears. And how does one differentiate one's useful, what's useful? And it also begs the question, extending forward around professional psychics and quote unquote intuitives, you know, what are they listening to on behalf of other people? And is it useful or when is it useful? When might it not be? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. How can you tell when something is a valuable intuition that's bubbling up from the self or like you said, body wisdom? And and when is it a complex or uh, almost a kind of um, paranoia, perhaps, or a rumination? How How do you differentiate? Well, I think it takes us into the process of discernment. Uh, and we've touched on it a little bit, uh, maybe very lightly earlier, that what would you do to check something out? You might uh, check it out factually and use your sensation function. Uh, you might check it out uh, from a feeling perspective with other people of how I felt and how it affected me and so on. You might sort of rise above it and think about it very objectively, sort of strategically but to use other functions and resources and see if it holds up. Well, and again, as I mentioned earlier, I certainly like to offer my clinical intuitions tentatively Mm -hmm. and allow the person I'm working with to say, no, that doesn't feel quite right. In the sense of the story that I told earlier, kind of having a foreboding or a hunch about something, what I've noticed is that when when you have a fear you sometimes think it's an intuition, but when you have an intuition, you know it's an intuition and you never wonder if it's just a fear. So uh, I've had that thing. I'm a little bit of a nervous flyer. So sometimes, you know, you get on the plane and you you feel a little nervous and you think, oh my God, I think I'm having an intuition. The plane's going to crash. I should get off the plane. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know if that's ever happened to you guys. It happens to me sometimes. Anyway, it's always just a fear. It's not like that dead knowing that I had that morning before I went to central Bosnia. It feels totally different. And although I sometimes wonder if a fear is an intuition, when I have the actual intuition, it's always just crystal clear that that's what it is. That's true for me anyway. Well, this this pushes into a realm that I often use, a criteria that a true intuition, when it shows up in me, is explainable, and it does not violate the conditions of the current situation. And in that way, it's congruent with common sense, which is what you were saying earlier, Deb, that my intuition goes into a situation, and it, in my mind, unpacks another level of what is either emerging or trying to emerge or trending in the emergence And it makes perfect sense to me as I work it backwards. What I think is different, as you were saying, Lisa, with vague fears and paranoias, that something will come in tangentially to the situation and it will not explain itself. And I cannot immediately link it or perhaps maybe ever link it to the deeper process that's right in front of me. So Joseph, what would you do with my story about the intuition I had that morning in in terms of what you're saying about it being explainable? This is the story about the danger in Bosnia? Yeah, just 
the sense of foreboding I had that morning. Mm-hmm. What I would have done is to sit and invite it forward to unpack itself, unpack the way it is or is not connected to a larger thread or network around me. And if I could not make sense of that, I would have probably put it in a certain basket of considerations that for me would not have been actionable. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I might have remained curious about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it helps not to sort of uh, overvalue intuition. Uh, it's part of us. Uh, some people have more access to it than than others. But really, intuitions are possibilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they're future. We we it, inherently we don't know. So to grab onto it um, as if it is somehow revealed truth seems to me probably uh, to be terribly one-sided. And people uh, like the scientists we mentioned, a singer who uh, perfected his sewing machine concept, the guy who dreamed about the uh, periodic table of elements, checked it out later. You know, Singer experimented. And uh, so did um, Medilev uh, experiment with it. Does it really hold up? Uh, but I think sometimes intuitions can come on so strong and they have such a big feeling component that we go, oh, my gosh, that must be it. It must be true. Uh, because why? Because I felt it. Well, use your other functions and other resources to hold it as a possibility. And I like what you said, Joseph, and invite it forward. A little act of imagination of, okay, come on, tell me more. Uh, unfold yourself. And in that moment of walking into a plane and just feeling a sudden surge of concern, I probably would scan the plane. Scan who's there, scan the plane to see if there is evidence that I can discern to, to be concerned. And also historically, having a sense of whether or not those feelings have trended to be um, useful and accurate, or whether the trending is that it, it's not terribly helpful in the past. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, in my own mystical work um, around the Kabbalah, that I tend to categorize things into three levels of non-rational information. One is non-rational information that my body reports, and I hold that with a certain level of curiosity. The next level up, which in my system we call the nefesh, it's a level of soul that connects human beings and creatures and structures on the planet. It's this undifferentiated field that all structures, all manifest life participates in. And that is an, is an ocean of imagery that does not report its meaning inherently, but requires an interpretive lens. So we can drop into a reverie, think about something and have a flood of images, but that doesn't necessarily tell us what the images mean. And developing that skill at linking the images to meaning is another step up. At the level of ruach, which is an a higher level of soul. We talk about the higher intuition, where there is an intelligence that can grant us a glimpse of the larger network of reality that if we had a sense of it, would make the right course of action absolutely obvious. Because the objectivity of that perception makes it clear how to navigate well and leaves us with very little doubt. And when that higher intuition comes into place, we are able to explain why and how we would be moving in a particular direction. It it is not Mm -hmm. mysterious. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. It's just sort of a very clear knowing. You, You know, there's a couple other things floating around for me. One is we've been talking a lot about 
the danger of overvaluing intuition, which is certainly there, right? If you're the kind of person who feels intrigued by this stuff, that's a danger. But I think on a cultural level, the opposite is actually true, that we don't make room for that which is Mm non-rational, that it tends to be easily dismissed, that it isn't taken seriously. You know, I think that that's a real one-sidedness in our culture that Jung knew about and discussed and, you know, was really concerned about. I mean, he was highly, highly intuitive. And that's one of the reasons why, frankly, he's difficult to read is, you know, intuitives will go off on these discursive journeys round about things. You know, it isn't necessarily a linear progression uh, through a set of ideas, but it's very associative. Yeah. That's such an interesting point that you've made of our culture being sort of hyper rational and cognitive, and yet as a compensatory mechanism in the culture, there's a lot going on with people seeking consultations with people like medical intuitives, going to psychics. And there are things like animal communicators who uh, help with um, mysterious illnesses or behaviors of animals. So it seems that there is that compensatory uh, function in the culture as well. Yeah, it's definitely compensatory. Yeah. And I am not sure, uh, I don't have experience with this, so I don't know what to make of of uh, psychics and so-called intuitives who can diagnose things of uh, physical illnesses uh, from afar by talking to you on the phone, for example, or something like that. And we're particularly interested in those moments where it's confirmable that people seem to know something that it wasn't possible causally that they could know. And how do we explain mm-hmm. explain that? Mm-hmm. And we're, we're in the realm of synchronicity where Jung posited and mystics have said for millennia that there is a field of intelligence and life which is connected to all points in space simultaneously, and that some people have a talent for being able to lower down into that field retaining adequate ego consciousness that they can report observations and then perhaps over time be able to interpret those observations with some accuracy and some usefulness. Mm-hmm. And, and in a sense, that's a little bit of what happens every night when we dream, which is why we can often get glimpses of patterns that are larger than our personal concerns because we're co-participating in something that is larger than ourselves, or at least the outer fringes of it are larger mm-hmm. than ourselves. Yeah, and, and some of it, you know, is accessing this field, and some of it, you use the word patterns, some of it is that the unconscious is just so good at taking in all of this information that kind of comes in below the threshold of consciousness And it just is detecting patterns, right? I mean, there's this slightly more mysterious side of it. And then there's this kind of matter of fact. The unconscious knows a lot because it's taking in everything and then chewing it up for patterns and feeding that back to us in our dreams. There's all of that. And we were trending in a moment towards the thesis in The Righteous Mind, the idea that we, in fact, are constantly cognating on a non-rational level and Mm -hmm. reaching compelling conclusions. And then the ego is often tasked with justifying those conclusions by scanning Mm -hmm. the environment and trending us, grouping us together (laughs) based on this similitude of non-rational conclusions. And I believe that Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, Blink, really supports what you just said, uh, Joseph, about uh, the unconscious picking up patterns and uh, that intuition is often based on just a lot of experience mm-hmm. and that then you can have have a hunch, quote unquote, that is actually informed by many years of experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
I remember when I was in social work school, we had this practice professor and we would all go off to our practicums and then come to that class at night and people would say, you know, I've got this client who's, you know, an alcoholic and, you know, he has this problem and she would sort of stand at the, I just thought she was a savant because she would just say, well, it probably is this, this, and this. And the person would go, oh, yes, you know, and it was just amazing. But, you know, now I, I sort of, you know, she was an old hand. She'd seen a lot of stuff and she, she just had all those patterns at her fingertips and had this incredible clinical intuition as a result. Mm -hmm. So with that, I wonder um, if anyone else but me is having a hunch that we ought to turn to a dream. <laughs> I'll go with that. <laughs> Hi, this is Deb from this Jungian Life podcast. Joseph, Lisa, and I have been deeply moved by your response to our work, but producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Once again, please go to this jungianlife.com and click on Be Our Patron. Thank you. Okay, today's dream is from a woman who is 37 years old and uh she is currently a stay-at-home mom, but used to work um, in nonprofits. And here's the dream. I walk outside of my front door and notice a storm is brewing in the gray sky. The wind feels like it could pick me up and take me, but I remain steady and fixated on the intensity and beauty of the sunset. I walk several feet and stand on top of a flower bed I've been building. I can somehow see all the way down the valley. I instantly hear a loud humming noise coming toward me, and when I look up, I notice a giant swarm of bees. They stop and hover above me. They drop as a whole to just above my head and then lift up again. I am aware it is scary, but I don't feel scared. They do it a second time, and I lie down in the dirt, gazing up at them. I'm surprisingly calm. Then when they lift again, suddenly a giant bird, an eagle, lands just above my head and starts pecking at the ground. The bees drop, almost suffocating me in this space with the eagle violently pecking around my face. I remain frozen and in awe. Then the bees fly away and then the eagle. And here is the context. In the last two and a half years, I have become a mother twice and my sister and her husband have cut my family out of their lives. A long-standing rift between my sister and my dad and her disapproval of me maintaining a relationship with him. I've spent a year and a half in therapy, but have been on a break since COVID-19. And the main feelings in the dream were an awareness of grave danger, a willingness and a need to witness, a feeling of overwhelming awe of nature's power and beauty. And uh, the final uh, bit of explanation she offers is, um, I don't know if I would have died or not, but I felt the bees and the eagle had the power of, or option to take my life. So what I notice immediately is the repeated theme of taking her. Uh, at the beginning of the dream, she feels like the wind could have picked her up and taken her. And uh, then at the end, uh, the sense that the bees and the eagle had the power to take her life. Yeah, and there is there is a sense, as she says, of like needing to witness. Like she, she needs to see this storm and this sunset. 
Um, she needs to see this swarm of bees. She remains calm to watch them. I am not sure, but I think that bees swarm like that uh, when they are migrating and going to start a new hive. I think that's correct. I think that's right, yeah. Um, it's, it's very tempting to go into bees and honey and all that jazz, but that's not what these bees are doing. And they surround her face. They drop almost suffocating her. It's such a vivid image. I think where I find myself going naturally is to a kind of sexual awakening that I think is brewing inside of her. Um, the last two and a half years, she's become a mother twice. Her body is recovering from childbirth. It's not uncommon for new moms to find all of their energy is going into the mystery of having new children, that her sense as a sexual being has probably been kind of quietly sublimated in other directions. So there's a storm brewing in the sky and the wind feels like it could pick me up. The entire psychic environment is filled with an archetypal power. And often wind is is connected to spirit, to the ruach, to the divine breath that's moving around. There's something electric that could happen and that the ego is wondering if it is going to be able to maintain its integrity in the face of this atmospheric changes that are going on. She's drawn forward by the beauty of the sunset, that there's something compelling and it's about aesthetic and beauty that's worth risking herself, risk, risking the ego integrity to move forward, to stay in connection to this vision of the sun. And she walks and stands on top of a flower bed that she's been building. Flower beds that are being built are ostensibly places that seeds are going to be laid in that are going to flower. And since the focus is on flowers rather than on vegetables, we know that we're talking about the sex organs of flowers, of plants, which are flowers, uh, which attract bees as part of this pollination and fertility symbolism. And that when she stands on the flower bed, herself almost becoming a flower, the bees begin to come towards her. And bees move towards flowers in order to sip the nectar and then have a fertilizing effect on the flower. It's as if she has herself become an irresistible flower. The eagle is traditionally the sign of the Scorpio force. Scorpio is astrologically connected to sexuality and particularly towards the more positive aspects of sexuality and its ability to rise upward in the chakra system and rise upward in terms of its creative applications. And the bees and the eagle maintain a strong proximity around her head versus her genitals, which lends support to this idea of the sexual force being sublimated upward in the personality to the higher creative centers in the brain. So to me, this seems like a spiritual awakening and a lifting up of her creative force away from this reproductive task that she has been involved in bearing children and a restoration of this creativity to a much higher center in the personality and even in the body for that matter. And there is something so intense about this process that it is almost frightening to her, frightening in its capacity because it's archetypal to redirect and sweep her life away from perhaps this much more Hestia grounded place that she's been in for the last two and a half years, having babies and tending them carefully. So I think she's on the precipice of a big change of priorities and experience of herself. Yeah, there's a lot of um, the theme of endings and beginnings here, isn't there? Being taken away by the wind, the sunset, the, 
the dying of the day's sun, the beginning uh, that is implied in the flower bed, and then this uh, amazing visitation of the eagle and the bees to which she submits. Uh, she says she's not scared. She's in awe. And I, I think this, um, I agree with you, Joseph, about the, the archetypal feeling here of all these natural forces. And it may be implied in some of the context, too, of uh, children, a cutoff from uh, her sister and family, maybe dying to some old things, and uh, clearly, I think, new beginnings. It, yeah, I think I would sort of add that there's this um, parallel or relationship between the storm, the swarm, and the eagle, that they they all play a kind of similar role in the dream, and she relates to them all in a similar way, which is with real curiosity, awe, and and sort of, as you said, Deb, submission. Joseph, I really like your idea about, you know, something's kind of awakening and coming up. I'm wondering about whether aggression might be a part of that. You know, the, the idea of a swarm of bees, you know, a swarm of bees is is uh, a, a single bee is one thing. A swarm of bees is almost like an aggressive animal mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of acting with one mind and could really do a lot of damage, as she says, in the context. And of course, the eagle is a, a bird of prey. So I'm wondering if part of what's awakening in her might be aggression and that might be what's called for when dealing with a family situation like the one she's facing. Like it takes aggression to kind of tolerate a cutoff uh, that she's going through to stand her ground and maintain the relationship with her father that she feels she needs to or whatever. So I wonder a little bit about that. Uh, I really resonate with that. I think there's uh, something there of the, these forces of nature which are, um, in a sense, unstoppable. They're natural forces. Yeah, and they get more differentiated. Like a swarm of bees is more differentiated than a storm, and an eagle is more differentiated than a swarm of bees. Mm -hmm. so, so something is uh, developing almost, even in the dream. I find myself focusing on the capacity to surrender that you had mentioned, Deb, as well, that we're faced with all kinds of strange, mythical moments in our dreams. And the outcome almost always depends on how the ego orients towards it. And I have this feeling that the work that she's done in therapy and the process of perhaps of becoming a mother and her life up to this point has prepared her well to receive pretty extraordinary messages from the unconscious and very intense feelings without overreacting, without evading, without being excessively defended to them. So it, it seems that she is poised in a really well-prepared place to be changed and deeply affected mm -hmm. by what's rising up in her psyche. Yeah. It's really a very encouraging dream, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. is to me. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.